as Tavong says, um, I'm going to share with you some perspectives that touch on some of the territory that Sandra and Andy covered, but from a utilizer's perspective. Um, just a word on my background, um, I spent a large part of my career on the legal and commercial side advising the export LNG projects, some of which Andy mentioned, uh, starting in Qatar, worked in Papua New Guinea, and also in Australia. But I have now moved and work with Globalec. We're a power developer on the African continent focused on renewable and gas projects. Uh, and I work on the gas side of the business. So we have a keen interest on the gas customer side. Uh, and I'll share, that will inform my view, both, both of those elements of my background. Um, okay, so first of all, maybe just pausing for a moment on the case for gas in the African context. Um, and I think this is important to just have a moment, particularly Andy, given the huge focus these days on climate change um, beyond our shores, but also here at home. Um, and Africa has a slightly unique uh, case to be made for gas, as opposed to viewing this from the eyes of a Californian grid or Northern Europe. There's a huge and growing need for power and energy on the African continent. And that need, that huge gap that needs to be filled uh, is going to take some substantial scale uh, power development. And I think gas is a relatively clean, flexible solution to drive that alongside of renewables. Um, that takes us on to renewables. As some of the speakers have indicated, I think gas presents a degree of flexibility to balance the intermittency that renewals in interjects onto the grid um, and does so in a way that currently doesn't exist on the battery side. Batteries eventually will displace some of what gas can do, but I would submit to you not all, and particularly in the African context, not all for a probably much longer time than certain jurisdictions that can afford to pay a premium. Of course, in the African context, maybe more than anywhere else, gas plays a role in decarbonization. So um, I'm interested in the energy mix globally that Andy put up. If you put the African energy mix up, um, South Africa, of course, were dominated by coal, but the Africa-wide energy mix is dominated by burning wood um, and then also from liquid fuels, so oil-derived products. Uh, coal is a, a distant third. Gas pushing into that mix decarbonizes significantly. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I would submit foremost what we need, whether we're sitting in Mozambique, we're sitting in South Sudan, or we're sitting in South Africa, is economic growth and development. And gas, given the significant domestic discoveries across the African continent, has the opportunity from those supplying countries to be the real final tipping point in driving pathways to middle income country status. For countries like South Africa that may eventually have some domestic gas, but really views this in where we stand today from an importing perspective, there's still an opportunity to drive reindustrialization um, and important economic growth and impact. So I would just conclude the case for gas by saying gas is, and most serious commentators would agree, globally the transition fuel. The debate focuses on how long is that bridge and I would submit to you in the African context, it's a very long bridge indeed, and gas is going to be playing a fundamental role in our energy mix uh, for some time to come. And I would include South Africa in that, and I would do that by highlighting two ways that I think gas um, participates in the African energy mix. The first is countries with huge domestic gas resources. Mozambique hosts the third largest dry gas find in human history. It's eye-watering the scale, we'll come on to that. Um, for those countries or existing producers like in Nigeria and Angola, the recent discoveries in Senegal, Mauritania, the Tanzanian discoveries, it's clear there's going to be a lot of gas available to the domestic economy. It is likely that a lot of that gas will be exported. There's no way those domestic economies can use all of it. But gas will be relatively inexpensive source for those domestic economies and likely will make up the base load of new power generation and should and will be the most cost competitive fuel, I would submit to you. Then there are countries without the huge domestic resources. Again, South Africa, where we stand today, that's us. We may have some significant potential and that may change, let's hope. Everyone needs some luck along the way, 
But today, we're a country that does not have substantial gas resources. And there we look at what should fill up our new power investment and energy mix. And Sandra introduced some of the key features that an IRP energy planning process is going through and has to consider. I think the IPP office presents some very interesting data that really doesn't exist anywhere else in the world in that it is procured renewables and started procurement of coal and gas with a fundamentally similar risk allocation. So you are actually beginning to compare apples and apples between technologies. And we see that you have the least cost power from that system on an IPP basis is certainly solar and wind, uh, including versus coal investment, certainly including versus gas. But solar and wind comes with intermittency and that takes us back into how do you load them onto your system in a usable way that optimizes for the grid and meets your demand curves and maintains grid stability, et cetera. And I would put to you that gas comes with renewables and wind, and together they're the kind of energy future for the South African grid as we stand today, but also a number of the countries across the African continent um, that don't host large-scale gas resources. So again, all of that detail just to underpin Gas is here. It is still a transition fuel on the African context, but I think the time horizons we're talking about are 50 to 60 to 70 year time horizons, despite some of the um, heat and um, uh, I would say uh, potentially over articulation of the shortness of the bridge. So we're here to talk about establishing a gas sector in South Africa. What's the key challenge? Well, in South Africa, it's supply constraint. We just don't have enough gas to, to, to meet um, you know, our ambitions. The PetroSA offshore blocks, that is essentially depleted, right? We have last gas flowing out of that now. Um, the Romco pipeline operated by Sassel with iGas involved, uh, with the Mozambican government involved, that is a field that is off the back of about three to four trillion cubic feet. Um, that field will not last forever, so there will come a horizon to that. The market is feeling some of that impact already. We've had some initiatives for import, um, but there have been delays to that. And Sandra, I think, um, succinctly articulated some of those. We've had some policy challenges in South Africa. Um, and while some of that is resolving, we now need to move through a, a, a concerted energy planning process um, you know, how do, we, how do we address those delays? So you've had from an IPP office-led procurement that was put on hold. You've had Western Cape exploration of an alternative kind of potential model. Um, that hasn't led to an actual LNG import terminal. You have the Transnet initiative currently still ongoing. You've had the challenging regulatory uh, environment, and let's start with the regulatory environment for South Africa's upstream potential. So um, MPRDA, hasn't ever actually landed with its update. Now talk of standalone oil and gas legislation. Where are we with that significant delays? It has not developed the requisite ingredients to host large scale investment in the upstream unless there were already requirements and licenses to take those forward. Nonetheless, we've seen some of that activity despite that challenge, but it's been very muted. Um, of course, the oil price has also played its role. So we had a very low oil price that tends to mute upstream exploration activity uh, given the economics of the, co the companies driving those activities. Uh, and then there's the overall energy planning challenge in South Africa. And I would say on the one hand that's running the process and trying to do that in the midst of a fundamental energy transition that is going on, but also the stakeholders on our board are under significant challenge. So reorganization of your single buyer off taker in the midst of trying to implement appropriate energy planning is an enormous challenge uh, to any system. So are there alternative models? Uh, Andy's hand hung his hat on one potential scenario that maybe seeks to address some of, some of those. We'll, I'll come on to some, some views from, from our side. So that's the challenges. On the other hand, right, there are alternative sources of gas and attr on attractive terms. We'll come on to the region recent, the regional game-changing discoveries. They remain game-changing discoveries. They are marching down the path to development. It means that there is gas in our region and it's at a scale that most regions in the world would, would, uh, is very, would be very envious of. The LNG markets, despite lots of transition and change and ebb and flow, 
remain very favorable for new importers. I was in the Philippines and Vietnam in the last 10 days because I still advise new importing country LNG governments um, and uh, you know, significant ambitious pro projects there that are gaining traction um, as two new importers of LNG. And they are able to do that and I'll come on to some description of why because of the favorable terms in LNG markets. And of course, the domestic, while we stand today in South Africa without an upstream of significant resource, the potential is significant. We've attracted some of the largest companies in the world. They don't show up and spend their money um, because there's no opportunity. Um, and of course, that's been a tiny step along the road, though a significant discovery with the Brulpada discovery showing that there is some actual resource there in the potential but a long way to go to understand um, what actually that resource is and what it will look like and what its road to commercialization will be and how we may benefit of it as, as the host country, as utilizers. And of course, there still is coal bed methane, so the unconventional gas, and there are projects that are advancing and taking shape, albeit at a relatively small scale uh, in terms of the ambition we would have for an overall gas economy, but they are happening. And there is crude shale gas, so we are all aware of the great opportunity that was maybe potentially over-articulated early in its development. It exists. Um, there are challenges. It likely will be developed uh, maybe a bit slower and over time rather than one big bang. So can we realize the opportunity of these alternative sources and how do we do that? So just a quick lightning tour on some of the recent game-changing discoveries. I'll focus on Mozambique. These are very conservative um, figures here. The actual resources are much larger. If you think of Pande and Tamane that's fed the Ramco pipeline and South Africa's existing gas economy essentially being three to four trillion cubic feet, most estimate that Mozambique will end up around 200 to 250 trillion cubic feet. So we're talking orders of magnitude uh, 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 in hand increase in supply. And you've got Tanzania, We've talked about South Africa a bit. So just to put those into perspective, talked about Pande and Tamane. Those are some of the other um, statistics. I'll just focus on, so Anadarko um, led the efforts to reach final investment decision in area one, which took place earlier this year. That was a 23 or $25 billion FID. Andy briefly alluded to it. Final investment decision in the context of large upstream LNG projects really means something. It's three to five years of work. It's commitment to the equity financing involved. So they are not taking lightning and they are very hard to reverse, unlike maybe FIDs and upstream activity. Um, area four and area one, um, of course, with Anadarko disposing of its assets, um, you have Total, um, stepping into those assets. And uh, so you have a real LNG player stepping into that project as well. The Exxon and ENI project in Area 4 is, I think, expected to take FID similar scale in the $20 billion range uh, this coming year. Um, and that, of course, is alongside the Coral Floater project, which now looks small compared to those projects. But, uh, you know, that was close to $10 billion in financing. That is FID and financial close. Um, and gas to come in the next two years. Um, so the upshot of all of that is Mozambique is likely to become the, and I think we're on a pathway where this is very hard to deflect this outcome, to be the third largest exporter of LNG in the coming years globally. Um, and, and that's significant. It will drive tremendous economic growth in Mozambique. LNG value change, just so that we're all talking about the same thing, upstream production of upstream, super cooling it to shrink the volumes into a ship that can send it to far-flung places of the earth that will pay and purchase the LNG. That's Andy running Stasco at Shell, which is one of the largest shippers of LNG in the world. That's the midstream element. And then the import, the regasification, either onshore tanks and regasification or a floating solution. And then the end users. Uh, Global X sits in here alongside of ESCOMs and other power developers in the industry and fertilizer users, et cetera. The evolution in the market has gone from big LNG, it takes a lot of finance to finance that infrastructure in the upstream. And historically, that meant coming together of the host countries, the big shells, totals, Exxon Mobiles of the world, the LNG sellers and then selling to highly creditworthy buyers, the, Tokyo the Japanese utilities, South Korean utilities, Taiwanese utilities. 
and in essence, you locked in a virtual pipeline. And you needed each end of that to make it all financeable. So there was no ability to divert cargoes, to sell outside of that. This was as if a pipeline existed for 10,000 kilometers across the sea. And so it meant most new buyers were locked out of buying LNG because they didn't have AA credit ratings. Um, they weren't able to sign up to 23-year long-term commitments, multi-billion dollar contracts, and they couldn't anchor the financing of the upstream. That has started to change because you've had, for a number of reasons, some intervening intermediaries into this. Equity lifting arrangements around projects where the upstream projects sell to themselves, traders coming into the market, the first wave of modern LNG projects actually paying off their debt, so suddenly they're at the end of their contracts and they still have capacity in their, in their projects, increasing buyer power in the market, countries like China coming onto the scene and being able to convince the investment thesis of the lenders to the upstream projects, but um, driving more flexibility into the market. This, the upshot of which, is increasing spot market, but more importantly than spot market, because long-term contracts still dominate, even though you're getting shorter and shorter co contracts, the upshot of this is that new buyers can purchase LNG and don't need a AA credit rating to do so. They still have to have a fundamental um, uh, investable thesis around their purchase of the LNG for the suppliers to supply to them, but it's opened the new wave of Asian buyers, and it should open the way for Africa uh, buyers. These are all projects that have been explored, are being explored, or um, uh, uh, you know, are, are in different stages of development. None of these have actually happened, except last week the announcement of car power ship in Mitsui to do what will be the first actual sanctioned LNG import project. Where? In the north of Mozambique, right next to where you have enormous uh, gas that's going to be meant for export. So no one has cracked the Africa LNG import yet, right? Um, but we're eligible to buy, we can buy. So, my last slide. What are some possible catalytic projects, scenarios where we might actually establish gas supply to South Africa and establish our sector? LNG import has to still be on there. Um, at first, likely from international markets, but, and this is something that I look forward to discussing in the panel discussion, all of the LNG markets today in all 40 importing countries have all anchored their greenfield import projects with power. It is very hard to see um, LNG import being anchored with some of the other potential utilizers of gas. It's a constraint we need to think about. Um, so that cuts across a little bit of some of the considerations that I very much agree with from what Sandra is saying in terms of the policy environment in South Africa, but how realistic is that policy debate if we really are, s are um, serious about uh, utility scale LNG import from international markets. Um, and part of that is because of our greenfield value chain. We're having to build the whole value chain. A Bangladesh, a Pakistan, they've developed a huge diversified domestic gas economy, which their domestic gas is now depleted and they are replacing that with LNG import. So what they are capitalizing is the import facility. That's it. What we need to capitalize in the African context is the import facility, some storage, um, additional kind of burner regas facilities, and then the, the, the actual downstream utilization itself to anchor it all. So three other potential scenarios. Can we look at regional delivery of gas, a kind of virtual pipeline? Hasn't really been done anywhere in the world. The car power ship Mitsui project is a kind of step towards that in a domestic context. Um, but is that an opportunity here? And importantly, can we drive a differential in the pricing from international LNG? One of the big challenges for the South African market is imported LNG, though at its historically lowest pricing, whether that's on a Henry Hub context or an oil link context, uh, is still significantly more expensive than the gas that flows down the Romco pipeline. And how do we address that differential? Do we still have demand for the higher priced gas? Well, could we partly split the difference with the kind of relevant regional LNG, where the LNG is more of a technology than it is a commodity. It's ring-fenced within a region, so um, you know, you're not trading it on an international, um, and maybe that's more of a kind of medium-term solution. And maybe it does give way to physical pipelines at some point. I share Andy's skepticism of large 
uh, pipelines uh, in this day and age um, beyond a thousand kilometers all in one bang. Uh, and then small scale LNG, um, you know, just very briefly, I'm a little bit out of time here, but I'm going to take two more minutes. Uh, New Fortress Energy, just as a case study, um, you know, powered locomotives in Southeast US. They had a position in small scale LNG and ISO containers. They applied for an exporting license to the US government. It was received. They exported small scale LNG ISO containers and took out 20 megawatt, 15 megawatt liquid fuel plants throughout the Caribbean. Very successful project. That feels to me quite fit for purpose for the African continent, including in South Africa. Um, could South Africa play a role in terms of being the uh, utility scale importer that where things are where the bulk is broken into smaller batches uh, to go on to the region and that goes back to most of the power generation on our continent are diesel gen sets right or hfo so can we take out those smaller scale uh, with a cheaper greener fuel uh, and then finally we have a lot of challenges ahead of us in South Africa as we get our policy and energy planning and market reforms and decide how we're going to organize our energy economy beyond gas. That is going to take time, whether we like it or not. And maybe the right play, if we put on our regional citizenship hats rather than a national uh, citizenship hat, is to build some of the gas utilization uh, capacity in Mozambique off the strength of this huge domestic find and then export the more refined product. We're building a plant in Mozambique uh, together with our partners Sassel and EDM which uses Sassel gas. That is a combined cycle plant that converts molecules into electrons. That will sell into the region through the Southern African power pool. Um, maybe there's more of that. So exporting electricity. Maybe it's creating ammonia plants. So taking gas and turning it into ammonia which is a feedstock for our fertilizer industry. Um, so you export ammonia to South Africa to feed our fertilizer rather than importing it from Qatar. Um, so I just offer that as a point for discussion um, as well as, as we uh, engage with this. So um, I'm going to leave it there. I think um, there's a huge amount of opportunity in gas. I share both Sandra and um, Andy's view that is critical for our energy mix in South Africa that we establish a gas economy. Um, I think there are scenarios and routes to do so, um, but it's going to, the time is now, and time is of the essence, and it's going to take a combination of private sector players, um, but also our policymakers coming together to uh, put some spin on the ball to get this rolling, but let's do it. Mm -hmm.